This is Joseph Kokum at TCAF 2015 on behalf of Becca Hilburn's Art Process Blog, Keep on Trucking Natto Soup. If you could introduce yourself, Jersey. I'm Jersey Drozd, cartoonist and teaching artist. Okay, and what brings you to TCAF this year? Uh, I got a new mini comic that I wanted to promote called Pickles and Taft Adventures for Hire. Uh, also, I have the print editions of uh, the Warren Commission Report, a graphic investigation into the Kennedy assassination, which I worked on with my friends Dan Mishkin, Ernie Cologne, and was published by Abrams Comic Arts. Awesome. Yeah, I got a chance to pick it up last night, but I haven't uh, looked it over. Can you tell me a little bit about it? Uh, the Warren Commission Report? Yeah, yeah. Warren Commission um, Report. So it's not a whodunit. It's not a uh, you know conspiracy theory exploration as such. I mean, that's part of it. Obviously, you can't strip that away from the, the story of the assassination. But it's more of an examination of the report that was filed a year after the assassination. So like Kennedy's assassinated. Uh, President Johnson puts together this this committee to say we got to settle the dust on this thing. We got to like assure the American public that we know what happened. So the Warren Commission is assembled to evaluate all the evidence. Uh, they were at odds with the CIA and the FBI and all these conflicting pieces of evidence. Plus, we have the story of Oswald that nobody knows exactly for sure what really was going on there. He, he was definitely a shooter, but who put him up to it? Was he just a crackpot? Was the CIA put it up to him? Did the Cuban government put him up to it? We examine all that stuff. We compare all the evidence. And then we close with some thoughts on how all of this story affected the culture of the United States at large. And we even ruminate a little bit on what would have happened had the government been more open and forthright with what they didn't know. Right. So it's, it's less of a whodunit, but more of an, a documentary of that story and the larger story surrounding it. Yeah. Uh, so what was your experience with working with the writers on that? I know you said you had a little bit of a spot job in terms of the art. Uh, was there good communication amongst the... It was three creators. Correct? Yes. Yeah. Dan Mishkin did the script. Ernie Cologne was one of the artists. And then I was brought on to help Ernie. And the, the art process is really weird on that. Like we traded off a lot of things. Some pages I drew more, some pages he drew more. The only thing I could say for sure that I did 100% was the coloring and lettering. Yeah. Um, but working with writers like Dan, Dan Mishkin is... I, every cartoonist should work with Dan to know what it's like to have a proper script. Because he writes in such a way that you see the page. He writes in this really descriptive way that's not laborious to it's, it's not it's, it's not like voluminous t text of like a description of everything in the room he just describes it in this light way where you see the shot so th I thumbnailed two-thirds of the book I did the layouts on it yeah. and it was almost I don't want to say it was effortless because it, it took work but it, it was so much easier than having to read a script where the description wasn't told from somebody with a visual imagination Right. I think that's it. Dan has were, a, He was focusing less, a little bit less on what is happening and more on just how they're going. You're going to show what's happening. Yeah, so. yeah. He knows how to describe something that elicits an image. He writes in a very comic booky way, uh, and he's very experienced in that. He knows how to do it. Uh, he's, he's worked for DC Comics for many years and done, and other companies since then. But um, it's just. I've never worked with a writer like that before where he makes it so, he, he meets me halfway as an artist so that all yeah. I have to do is go, oh, I hear what you're saying, this is how you do it, right? So Dan is fantastic, but Dan also did an enormous amount of research on the book. Uh, this is another thing that a lot of writers, they should look at Dan as an example. <laughs> he gave me this Word document with link, 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 here's all the photo reference you need. You don't have to look up anything. Just draw this, right? So uh, I did have to do a little bit of research on my own. Uh, but very little for something of this of this magnitude where you can't fake anything, yeah. right? Like text it's, school book deposit. It's not necessarily the subject matter you're used to. So in a lot of no. those circumstances, you have to look up a bunch of reference. But if he's just providing it for you, then he provided all, all the easier. reference. Yeah. That's the best. That's the best. Writers, all writers should do that. So yeah. yeah. So I mean, that's a little bit uh, heavy for comics, I would say. Um, like Warren Commission report involving all these government agencies and that sort of thing, but that's a great thing about TCAF. There's all kinds here. So. Yes, yes. I mean, that's the cool thing. TCAF is like one of those conventions, festivals, where I can take a mini comic about a bear and a bird fighting lizard monsters and put it next to the Warren Commission report, and nobody goes like, "What?" Nobody's yeah, like, "Why do you have these two things on your table?" No, they're just like delightful. I like both of these things because I read everything. You know, yeah. it's a very awesome audience here. Yeah, I did get a chance to look through some of your minis last night, and they're they're pretty great. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> um, so I know your TCAF experience is starting a little bit sooner than others because you were also a part of the Educators Day, correct? Mm -hmm. uh, what was I mean? I I attended your panel. Uh, what was your experience with getting that set up um, and uh, coming a little bit early, having a table the next day, that sort of thing? 
Um, well, okay. I'm gonna take it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take your question. I'm gonna back up just two steps and make a little bit of a rant because you 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 should have said trigger warning in there. <laughs> but I'm like, sorry. I, like, no, no. It's just for me. I think it's super important for cartoonists. Like, we go into this line of work because we like to be alone. You know, it's like, I don't like talking to people or I'm shy and I like to express myself, but in a way that's quiet and I don't have to like follow up. I draw my thing, here you go, read my thing, we're yeah. done here. I'm, I, I made my expression, I get to go home and play video games again. Uh, I think increasingly we're facing a, a world where cartoonists don't have that luxury as much anymore and we have to get involved more and we have to engage more. Uh, and we, there's all different ways to engage. You don't have to go and teach necessarily, but that was the world that I found that I was the most comfortable with, is like getting involved with teaching. It's partially advocacy. I want people to understand why I think comics are so wonderful and why they should, why they should be excited about them too as a medium. Yeah. Um, but it's also to equip teachers to use them in their classroom for the kid who was like me, who was drawing Spider-Man and the teacher thought that that was a bad thing, right? Like they should know that this is a good thing, that this is how they internalize information by putting scribbles on the thing. And yeah. that was one of the things I talked about in the workshop. You might have seen that part. Yeah. Um, so it's partially that we have to be more involved. We have to get out in front of our medium a little bit more uh, as the public starts to understand it a little bit more deeply and get more excited about it. But also uh, it's about, for me, it, it's it's, there was no effort involved in coming a day early because I want to be involved. I want to participate and I want to help any teachers who show up to say, tell me more. I want to be there to help represent my medium and my people, as it were, to the best of my ability. And I'm right. just grateful that TCAF, uh, the folks at TCAF uh, gave me the space to do it, you know, because I know that they probably sifted through a lot of programming proposals. Um, and then the other part of it is that I, one thing I feel really strongly about is, uh, I pre presented them with a hands-on workshop. It wasn't just me doing a presentation. Everybody watch my thing. Okay, I'm gonna talk about a thing. Here's some slides. Yeah. This is well, really important. We should all think about how important this stuff is. Now go forth and think about how important all that stuff was. It was more like, no, we're gonna, I started the workshop by saying, we're gonna draw today. And, I, and it was fun watching like half the room go, <laughs> we didn't know that. We were just here to listen. And, no, you're here to draw. Well, half the room was in the back, right? Half yeah, the room, they the other were. half was in the front. It, it, and it was, was a like, pretty clear delineation of people who were ready for it. <laughs> yes, that's, that's very true. Yes, there were, there were the kids in the back of the classroom, right? <laughs> Uh, but the coolest thing in the world for me is watching them go from, oh, he's going to make us draw, to at the end, they're like, hey, Jersey, Jersey, look what I drew. You know, like, just like a little kid, you know? And like, I love that, because like, and then I, I point it, I'm like, you know the feeling you have right now? That's what the feeling kids have when you do these activities in the classroom. That's why it's important that you do that, you know? You're yeah. empowering somebody, you're making it less frightening, you're making it something that they can, they don't just read, that they engage with and they make their own. You know, so um, yeah, that, that stuff's all baked into my personal philosophy, and that's another fun part of this. Is you to share your philosophy? Yeah. Uh, speaking of, you have several podcasts. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think you talk about those enough. But what came first? I, I do want to ask the teaching or the podcasting. They happen around the same time. Okay. Uh, so I started teaching in 2007 or so. Uh, I was working with the Arts of Michigan Literacy Arts Comic Book Project which was this uh, project where I was paid to visit 10 different Detroit public schools for a series of, I don't know, it was like six months or something like that, teaching comics workshops for the kids, or teaching comics classes. They were actually built on one another. And I was being trained under a professor of education at the University of Michigan. Uh, so I was both getting trained in teaching while teaching, while collecting data on the student reactions to, the, to prove uh, the, the thesis that reading and making comic books boosts key literacy comprehension skills. Yeah, I never had any interest in teaching before. I took the job, literally, and I've said this in other podcasts. Uh, I took the job literally because I needed the money, and yeah, then once I got in a classroom, wrong with that. well, no, it was it was a job, right? Yeah. And uh, I, I once I got in the classroom, I found out that oh, I'm kind of good at this thing, and kids really respond positively to it. And hey, I get to introduce kids who have never thought of making a comic before. I get to make them like I get to provide that inroad, right? Yeah. That felt really magical, really cool. Uh, and so I wanted to do more of it. At the same time, I was having phone conversations with my cartoonist buddies, as you do. You're working, you're lonesome, and you know, you, somebody else has got to feel this frustration that I feel. So you're talking while you're drawing, and we would have these talk, these discussions about craft, and about like a nine panel grid versus a six panel grid, and the way you pace things out and define traditional reading directionality. Yeah, really and we'd always- comic stuff. <laughs> yeah, the really like nerdy craft stuff, right? Uh, and at the end of those conversations, we'd always say, like, how come we don't hear this in podcasts? You know, like, there were lots of podcasts in 2007 about comics, 
but they were mostly about the direct market comic books, interviews with writers and artists at DC Comics, and they were the interviews were conducted by people who weren't practitioners necessarily. So they didn't necessarily know where to go. It's like like you'd hear like John Romita Jr. say like, oh, well, I like to use this kind of brush versus that kind of brush because this kind of brush gives you this kind of line, that kind of brush gives you that kind of line. And that would be the part where I as a cartoonist would be like, whoa, tell me more. But then the, the interviewer <laughs> says, that's great. That sounds boring. <laughs> yeah, that's great, but that doesn't mean very much to me. So let's go, like, what do you think Wonder Woman's going to look like next year, right? Yeah. Which is an interesting question for a certain audience. There's nothing wrong with that. But I, as the creator, am going like, ah, you, you cut him off when he got yeah, to the good stuff. The best part. <laughs> so that was why I started doing it, was me and my buddies who I was talking with on the phone, you know, we were like, we're not hearing this conversation happen anywhere. Let's just document it. You know, let's just have those conversations. We'll record it, see what happens. We had no, we never sat down and said like, this is what's going to come out of it. We're going to, you know, make more friends in the industry. We're going to get more publishing opportunities as a result of it. None of that was on paper. We just wanted to record the discussion so it could exist somewhere in case there's some bozo like us who's really interested in brush tips, yeah. you know? But doesn't and, know where to go to find the information or there is nowhere to find the information. Or even is something as simple as is somebody else as frustrated with this as I am. Right? Just yeah. knowing that you're not alone on something kind of counts. Uh, yeah, that was a lot of the inspiration for Becca's art process blog too because it was just so difficult to find people being open about the tools they use and the processes they use because it, I guess they felt like everyone was competition and if they figured something out, it was something that was going to get them ahead in career while other people would stagnate. But that's not necessarily the case. Sometimes it might be, but... Or, or they think that they have to come at it like a guru. Right? You either yeah, have to. You don't to, want to admit that you don't know something. Oh, yeah. And, and for me, it's so much more interesting when it's not about teaching somebody the right way to do something, but more about sharing of an experience doing something. Right? So, like my classroom experience, and you probably saw this in the workshop that you participated in or we were witnessing, is that it was less about me saying, this is how you do it. It was more like, how do you think this works? What do you think is happening here? What, what, when you look at these two images, what stands out to you and why? Right? And I'm, and I'm going to be here as an administrator to help piece together the narrative that we're constructing as a group, but I'm not the expert that you go to for advice. I'm just the facilitator. You're the experts, right? Hey, and I'll say, like, did you notice when this person said this? That was really insightful. Let's share it with the whole room, right? Everybody's there to teach everybody. And to come at it from a sense of, I'm going to do an art podcast bid where I tell you the right pens, the wrong pens to use. Everybody's got opinions, right? I love this pen. I don't love that pen, you know? But... I think part of the reason that people feel stymied is they about getting involved in doing this stuff is they say like, well, I'm not an expert. You're not supposed to be. You're yeah. supposed to just share your experience in making something because there's somebody out there who, whatever reason, they're going to get something out of that in terms of just knowing they're not alone, looking at it from another point of view. I never thought of using tools that way. Whatever. But that's why, that's why you work in a lab. That's why you work in an art community. That's why you talk with friends is to share ideas and input, not in an expert way, but in a friendly kind of like, I'm interested in this stuff, and this stuff is interesting to talk about. Definitely. And also, I mean, artists will look at your work and judge how competent they think you are. So it's not, yeah. like, it's not like you're going to mislead anyone because they can see your ability, and if they don't <laughs> yeah. deem it appropriate, then they, they'll just ignore your advice. Right. So no harm, no foul. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> but uh, so you do have uh, Kids Read Comics coming out, correct? Yep. Right. That's in comics.org. So that's the the two day. Well, actually, it's now it's a three day festival in Ann Arbor, Michigan, where uh, it's a lot like TCAF. It's it's free admission to the public. Um, big difference is that the tables are free for artists. We don't charge for tables, and we provide lunch for the artists. It's free lunch for all participating artists. Nice. All we ask in 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 return is A, you gotta come out on your own dime. That's not the easiest thing in the world for everybody. Yeah. Uh, and B, if you do come out, we ask that you participate or lead a hands-on workshop of some sort for kids. Right? Yeah, that's so, pretty, pretty standard. A lot of anime conventions, for instance, will trade you a panel for um, a table, essentially. Okay, cool. Yeah, I didn't know other places did that too. That's awesome. And I think that's, I think that's a reasonable trade. I mean, I, mm -hmm. providing that you can provide a platform where people can actually make money at your thing. That's something that's always been an, it's an ongoing struggle with all conventions, right? You yeah. hear lots of people, some people say, I did great at this show, I did terrible at this show. And you get mixed stories no matter what show you go to. But the goal is that, yeah, we'll provide you with the platform to sell your stuff and then we just ask you like to donate an hour of your time to get kids excited about comics. Um, 
So yeah, so like uh, all weekend long, every hour on the hour, there's some kind of participatory workshop for kids because for me personally... Everyone's donating their time. Yeah, Yeah. well, and, and it's about it's about going to get the autograph but also drawing with the celebrity, right? You go to the thing and it's like, oh, there's Jack Kirby, there's Marie Sendak, there's whatever artist that you admire is there. And like, I'm gonna get the thing signed. And that's a wonderful, meaningful interaction of a kind. Yeah. But how much better would it be if Jack Kirby then turned to you and said, hey, you wanna draw together? Oh my God, right? That would change you forever. And one of the things that Dan Mishkin, the president of Kids Read Comics says, is he says that we're in the business of changing lives. That sounds really huge and puffed up and highfalutin, but it's kind of what we're trying to do. Uh, and so, yeah, this will be our seventh year doing it. And, you know, we get anywhere between 2,500 and 3,000 people coming through the doors over the weekend. We don't charge admission, so it's hard to take a head count. Um, and it's on the first floor of the Ann Arbor District Library, and uh, that's where the Artist Alley is. And then we have workshops and events happening all over downtown. So 826 Michigan will have some events going on. The Vault of Midnight, our local comic store, will have some events going on. The Ann Arbor Art Center, where I do teaching, is going to have workshops going on all day. So, so it's kind of like Free Comic Book Day, where it's just the community coming together and doing comic book things, except they're around... Yeah. Yeah, except around like just like uh, Kids Read Comics Day, basically. And yeah. then the Friday before, the reason I said it was three days, is the Friday before we have a, just like TCAF, uh, an educator and librarian conference where we have uh, uh, programming all day long for people who are interested in integrating comics into their school library, school curriculum, or their own library collection. And I'll be leading my Comics Pathway to Learning class there. Uh, and Carol Tilly is going to be doing a talk on the history of comics. And we're going to have a panel discussion with Colby Sharp and a bunch of librarians and university professors on integrating comics into courses and curriculum and in collections. Awesome. Oh, and it's going to conclude with a, uh, a tour of the University of Michigan's video game library. So they have a they have a, a video game library with like every conceivable console and thousands of games. You can play yeah. a Virtual Boy. Remember I those? You you had an interview with uh, the curator of that right? Yeah, yeah Dave Carter, That's the librarian. Episode. Yeah, yeah it's, it's an amazing collection, and it's like yeah, you just go there and play video games. So we're going to have a tour of that. We'll conclude with a party at the Vault of Midnight where you can. We're going to have a giant draw wall facing Main Street, and all the artists just get together and draw. Fantastic. Uh, we did it last year, and one of the best. This is like one of the best. This is why I do the thing, because uh, I don't get paid. Uh, <laughs> but the reason I do it is we were doing this giant draw wall at this restaurant at, at, after the Friday pre conference, and like there's all these artists like Ben Hackey, Raina Telgemeier, Dave Rowe, all these like, you know, awesome like kids comic superstars are all drawing on this wall. This kid shows up at the restaurant with his parents. He didn't know what was going on. He was just there for a boring family dinner. Yeah. And he looks and he sees all his favorite authors <laughs> on this wall drawing. With recognizable characters as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah right? And like the kid comes over and timidly says, like, can I go draw on the wall? We're like, yeah, get over there. And so like we had a bucket of markers. And this kid, like what was going to be a boring family, I turned into this amazing, memorable night where he got to draw with his favorite, you know, book <laughs> authors. How cool is that? That's the best. Uh, so I did want to ask you, I mentioned to you before we started talking that it can be a little bit difficult for children's book authors and illustrators to get the word out there, especially if they're not tied to uh, a publishing company, if they're self-publishing. What advice would you have to uh, people who are specifically targeting children? It might be considered all ages, but their core demographic would be children in terms of getting it into the hands of kids. Other yeah. than going to Kids Reads Comics, obviously. Well, yeah, that, obviously, <laughs> that'd be the self-serving first thing. Come to Kids Read Comics. Yeah, yeah, but we only have, like, limited table space. So, sure. you know, there's a, there's a wait list every year to get in there. Um, oh, wow. Uh, it's tough. When you're doing stuff on the Internet, you know, uh, there aren't many places that parents feel are safe for kids, right? Uh Parents don't necessarily want the kids signing up for Facebook before they're 15 or 16 years old because of all the stories that were told, stranger danger and all the like. Uh, kids don't necessarily understand or want to be part of Twitter. You know, like like we as adults go like Twitter's amazing, but that doesn't mean a 12 year old really cares about like saying I I, I eat the chips, I'm done eating the chips. Uh, <laughs> so where do you find them? And like so, I teach a lot of youth classes, and anecdotally speaking, I can say that the places I see kids gravitating towards content are YouTube. YouTube's the number one. They all love YouTube and they all have their favorite YouTube stars and their favorite YouTube channels and their favorite YouTube videos. You know, like five years ago it was ASDF. That was the one, if you didn't know ASDF, you were, you, you were nobody, you were nothing, you know? 
Now it's Five Nights at Freddy's and videos of people playing Five Nights at Freddy's. Like, that's the big thing. <laughs> um, but yeah, YouTube is the one place where kids go to get stuff. So having some kind of video presence on YouTube is, I think, very important. And when the kids see that I do videos on YouTube, they don't necessarily go like, oh, I want to watch an hour show where you've talked philosophically about comics, yeah. but they're impressed. They're like, oh, you're real. You're like a real author because you're on YouTube, you know? Because <laughs> to them, it, it feels that way. And like, when they're like, oh, you got over a thousand subscribers. Oh my, you know? Uh, the other place is Instagram. And that's why my webcomic, Boulder and Fleet, is on Instagram because I noticed that for whatever reason, they're not interested in Facebook or their parents won't let them use it. They're not interested in Twitter, but, but Instagram is the place where they go to follow celebrity photos uh, and share photos with their friends. So I figured, okay, if I'm findable there, uh, that will be a good way to... And, and the uptake on Instagram hasn't been very... It hasn't been awesome. I've been doing it six months now. Maybe got 40 something followers. So it's like I don't have any evidence to support my theory just yet. Okay. Uh, but I'm, I'm doing little experiments with different kinds of tags and stuff. Uh, well, Boulder and Fleet is a sequential kind of comic, not like a daily gag sort of thing. So that might exactly be an it. issue. That's, part, that, that's all one of the many variables we're weighing when we're trying yeah. to figure out how to position our comic. The other thing I would layer on top of that is if you are a youth, a, a cartoonist making comics for young people, then you have to get on the radar of librarians. Because, okay, so here's the problem, as I see it personally, is kids... They have a filter to their content, and that's their parents or their teachers and their librarians, right? The, the kids get their stuff through trusted channels. What's the number one way kids get the access to comics? The Scholastic Book Club. Scholastic Book Club is a vetted thing that comes into schools. And the parents see it because it's in It's a the homes. trusted channel, right. Yeah. right? How do you become a trusted channel? Well, there's a lot of ways you could do it on the internet, and there's like COPA compliance. If you want to Google that, COPPA compliance, and that's very difficult to achieve COPA compliance as a website. And even then, it's how do you get the parents to know that this is a site where stuff is accessible to kids. Yeah. Also, parents' time is limited. They want to get things in aggregate. That's where Scholastic Book Club and stuff, stuff like that is so valuable. So you have to get your stuff on the radar of the people who are the filter to the children. Yeah. And that's librarians and parents. Well, librarians, you go to ALA, the American Library Association annual conference where they have a free artist alley. Right. Uh, Specifically the annual. The winter conference does not have an artist alley, as I understand it. Uh, as I understand it, that's the case as well. I've only gone to annual myself. And that's, yeah. and that's a place where you can go with a whole bunch of free stuff, make sure that you got a lot of free stuff, and the librarians will take it. And that's a way to get on their radar. And yep. so that then when you, if you want to maybe amass a mailing list or, uh, or some other mechanisms to get in touch with the librarians so that you can market your book to them directly. It's always tricky with librarians because they usually order through distribution channels like Baker and Taylor and Ingram and Diamond. Yep. So if you want to sell directly, it's not the in the world, but it's something that's at least achievable. Then the next layer I would layer onto that is start local and work with your local library to develop programming with them. Because librarians are always looking for ways to get people to use their spaces. Yeah. And if to you entertain are entertain children as well, so yeah, I mean, and they want, they want all libraries right now are interested in maker kind of things like maker spaces and and ways to get the community to think of the library as a place to make stuff, yeah. not just consume stuff, because uh, that's their value proposition they have over a bookstore. You can't go to Barnes and Noble and make things necessarily, well, you, right? You probably shouldn't. You shouldn't be drawing into <laughs> me of the book. You're not going to go get Tom Engelberger's Origami Yoda and start making the origami in the, the, the bookstore. No, that would probably get you a little bit in trouble. But in the library, they want that. So if you can propose some kind of hands-on participatory workshop for your local library, and it may seem like, well, I'm only reaching 10 kids. That's how you start. And yeah. that's how I started in Ann Arbor. I started with just like these simple little one-off workshops with 12 kids and then it turned into a six-part series that happened every summer, which turned into a relationship that turned into me doing the Comics Great podcast with them, which turned into bringing kids read comics to the Ann Arbor District Library. It took seven years. It's an investment, but it is achievable if you're serious about it, right? Yeah. Uh, and I think that's another hard thing about publishing in general is any path is going to be a hard slog, and there is no path. Yeah. All you can do is say, like, well, this, this combination of things work for this guy. Maybe I can, like... Those puzzle pieces a little bit. Out. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's been everything. a big frustration uh, toward, with Becca. Everyone has advice, especially people outside of the industry. It seems like, and it's like, of course, I've tried a lot of these things, but there is no cut and dry way to become a successful author or illustrator. So while I do encourage people to give me advice, don't necessarily think that you have the solution. Exactly. Is the gist. 
<laughs> that is exactly right. I mean, in all of us, I mean, that's the hard thing about the hard thing about growing up in general is like learning that oh, everybody's faking it all the time, and everybody's just as panicked as I am all the time. Yeah. Uh, you get a little bit more at peace with the panic, I think. I think. <laughs> Especially if you have a steady paycheck, like you do coming from the school, but yeah. Yeah, yeah well, steady, <laughs> I mean, like one year it's like, yay, I'm a success, but the next year it's like, oh no, and they took it away from me. So it's never, I've not, for, for me personally, I've never experienced steady, you know, I've experienced, okay. I've experienced relationship, right? I got relationships with places, but it doesn't necessarily mean automatic income, uh, but I think the value of the relationship is this thing that should that is the one thing that you should really be in pursuit of because that will help safeguard you against the high and low tides of being a professional cartoonist okay. um, and 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 it's also it's a richer way to exist i mean like riches riches in like the human way like in ebenezer oh, yeah. scrooge's story those kind of riches right like the riches of of community and and, and friendship and family and feeling like you're contributing to something larger than what you're trying to do, or like larger than yourself, right? Um, it's highfalutin, it's kind of squishy, but <laughs> I, I think that that's also a way to help sustain yourself uh, in, in a way where, uh, you know, people will, people will more apt to remember you when the gig opens up, right? Because your name is associated with this good giving. Yeah, this good, and that is, I don't really want, I don't want to put it in as, as crass as like, you gotta give to receive. It's not about doing a bunch of spec work. It's definitely not that. Yeah. But it's about um, contributing in some positive way to your environment so that your name means something to people. Right, okay, so it's different than doing work for free. Like doing, like teaching at a library, I charge. And my rates are right on my website. Like if you want me to visit your library, I will do an awesome workshop for you and I work with kids and I'll be very, you know, like uh, I'll give them all personal attention, yeah. but it's gonna cost you. Yeah, you're gonna I have to pay for my hotel and at least a per diem, maybe a little bit of cash on the side. Yep, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get like a presentation fee, you know, yeah. Um, and yeah, I'm gonna have travel expenses and things like that. So yeah, you charge for all that stuff. Yeah. But, um, but you make yourself available for that stuff. Right, that, that, that's the difference. Uh, I, I would never advocate doing spec work unless it's something you feel extremely strongly about. Like if this is like a, a, a mission that I am fired up about and I want to do my share, I want to do my part for this thing, yeah. sure. But if it's because you think that it's gonna give you some kind of benefit in the long run, in my experience and a lot of experience of a lot of other artists, it almost never It can does. be kind of thankless, yeah, because it almost devalues your time. So why would someone why would we Get offer more you money you when, when we know you've done it for free before? You. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, precisely. Like, yeah, I mean, and that's that's been my experience as well. Is like when I undercharge or uh, do it on spec, it just becomes an expectation. And then when I do say, hey, you know what, my time's kind of valuable. A lot of times they'll say, oh my gosh, we didn't know. You know, we didn't know that you actually wanted money for this here. You know, so like you, a lot of times it's not you're not aligned by asking, yeah. and your work has value. Right, um, and so I joked around about not getting paid for kids read comics. We're a five hundred one three C nonprofit. We're exploring ways to make ourselves salaries out of this thing because that is something that, as we've grown the show, we're like, you know what, this is a little bit like work. We should yeah. be getting paid for this. Kind There's of a time. lot going on yeah. behind the scenes and just straight up front. So I, I would imagine. Yeah. Um, so, is there anything else you're gonna be releasing in the near future? Obviously, Boulder and Fleet is relatively new. How many pages did you say you have of it online right now? Uh, I, I did about it's about 26 pages in at the time of this recording, uh, right. and it's weekly for now. Uh, I do plan on releasing a Patreon eventually for it, and that. I don't plan on doing any special tiers where I'm going to be like, oh, if you pledge at this amount, you'll get this extra thing. I'm more or less going to state, here's like a target goal. If I can make this much money, if I can generate this much support for the comic, I could go five days a week, right? But until yeah. then, it has to be weekly. And it's a bummer because, uh, yeah, I'm doing it on the side in addition to all my paying work, and it's only a square, 2400 pixel by 2400 pixel square on Instagram right now. Um, so there's only so much you can do in there. I'd like to do it more frequently. I'd like to do it five days a week, but until I can make that a full-time job somehow, that's where I am. Sure. So that's the only new thing that I'm thinking of right now, um, but you never know. Like, well, years are funny. What other conventions are we going to see you at? You said um, you had to cancel ALA, right? So. I had to cancel my appearance at ALA this year, unfortunately, yeah. uh, and I'm very. it was not easy to pull that trigger because I, I love that convention so much. Well, obviously, we're going to see you at Kids Read Comics. Kids uh, Read Comics. What other conventions in the future? 
that's that's it right now. Okay. Uh, and then the other places, I'm always, almost always on YouTube. As you pointed out, I do a lot of different shows. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, every two weeks, I do a show called Lean Into Art, where me and my buddy Rob Stensinger, who's a game designer and comic book artist, we get together and we crunch for two hours on really difficult storytelling topics. And we stream it live on YouTube uh, at 10 p.m. Eastern every other Thursday. Okay. Uh, finally, would you have any advice to someone who's considering attending TCAF for the first time, an artist uh, considering tabling here? Uh, bring lots of water. <laughs> yeah. And uh, bring food because you will be stuck behind the table for a long time unless you have a buddy to like tap to you out. You. Yeah. Because the, the crowds are intense. I, mean, I, I think the staff might actually be willing, because there's a lot of staff around. The staff might be willing to sit at your table for a brief period of time, but don't yeah. expect to go out and have have a long luxurious lunch while the staff sits at your table right I wouldn't I wouldn't ask some volunteer to like man my table for two hours no but I mean like for bathroom breaks and stuff yeah, yeah. because but but I mean it's it's an intense show but I mean the other thing I would say is like uh, what I love about this show and it's what I love about SPX is the crowd comes looking to discover something you know, uh, if you ever go to like a lot of like traditional comic book conventions yeah, where they have movie stars, they want to see stars. the big authors or the big names. Yeah. yeah, they're there to go meet the guy who drew up Spider-Man right now, or they're there to get Patrick Stewart's autograph, which is awesome. I mean, that's and I go to those shows too, and it's fun. But as a publisher, a self-publisher, uh, I want to go to the show where people want to discover new stuff, yeah. and everybody comes here to go, "What's new? What's new? What can I buy?" Uh, and people come here to buy books. It's great. So, uh, also, yeah, make sure that you bring enough books. You know, don't just bring ten because you didn't sell well at another show. You're gonna be selling like twenty or thirty, forty books, even if you're not, you know, widely known. Nobody's coming up to the table saying, "Oh, Jersey Droz, thank God." They're coming and they're like, "Oh, Cat and Cat, that's cute. I like it." So, okay. Well, I hope you have a good TCAF. Thanks for so much for talking to me. Well, thanks for letting me talk. <laughs>